Today we're talking about a 1980s property that I have loved since I was like 5 years old. A byproduct of the golden age of animation and children's entertainment. A beloved series with a loyal following and fond memories that I carry with me to this day. Today is all about Jace and the Wheeled Warriors. 1985's Deke Entertainment series, written by J. Michael Straczynski, ran for 65 episodes from the fall of 85 until the summer of 1987. Deke are the same people who produced the last season of G.I. Joe A Real American Hero after grossly undercutting and underbidding competitors picking up the series from Sunbow. JMS also worked on Masters of the Universe with Filmation. It was actually a lack of credits on the He-Man spin-off he made with Larry Dottilio, She-Ra, that was the catalyst for him finding his way to Deke Studios. Producer Gene Shalopin worked on the series having wrapped up with another epic series, Ulysses 31. As I mentioned earlier, I absolutely loved this series as a kid. It was right up there for me with G.I. Joe, Transformers, Motu, Voltron, Thundercats, Mask, Centurions, Silverhawks. I feel like I'm naming them all at this point. One of the coolest things about this series is the awesome music. The opening theme song is absolute banger, one of the best of all animated series if you ask me. This score was done by Shuki Levy, who also worked on Mask, along with Saban of most notably Power Rangers fame. So who are the Wheel Warriors? Well, Jason Jace Lightwheel was chosen for an intergalactic mission to join his father, Audric Lightwheel, and save the cosmos from the evil Sawboss and his monster minds. Jason teamed up with the Lightning League to thunder across the stars to save the universe from the monster minds. Lightning League is comprised of Jace, Herc, Gillian, Flora, and Oon. The Lightning League was founded by the Lightwheel family. Gillian Lightwheel is the wizard grandfather of Jace. Audric is Jace's father, and Jace himself would become leader of the Lightning League. Gillian created Jace's little sister Flora from a plant and is also the one who created the first vehicles for the Lightning League. Flora also has a magic flying fish that she travels around on, although she does drive some vehicles, but that fish's name is Brock. Oon is the team's robot sidekick who was modeled after a medieval knight, but ironically is pretty much scared of everything. He comes armed with a magic lance to complete the knightly look. Herc, Storm Sailor, rounding out the Lightning League crew, was a space pirate and mercenary before joining Jace's crew. The scruffy-looking nerf herder is the captain of his own freight airship called the Pride of the Skies and rides into battle with the Lightning League along with the Spike Trike, the League Scout vehicle. Mattel's Wheeled Warriors line featured a lineup of vehicles that all had these snap-on, snap-off parts that could work with all the other Wheeled Warriors vehicles. It was a really interesting way to mix and match combining the best of G.I. Joe and Transformers and giving the line a lot of creativity and playability. It's an 80s toy line. Gotta have a gimmick, right? Unfortunately, the line didn't come with the main characters as their human counterparts, just these generic figures. And the toys were meant to be the main characters of the toy line, which is why that happened. Although that's a bit of a divergence in the IP, which may have also led to its lack of success at retail. In addition to the vehicles, there was also a Lightning League victory pack and the Monster Minds attack pack, which were supplemental accessory packs for both factions. After the toy line was released, then came Deke's animated series to support it. Much like many lines at the time, G.I. Joe included, the animated series was effectively a long toy commercial in disguise. The toy line didn't do well, there was a limited written media, and so the animated series, though it lasted 65 episodes, was cancelled before the story was actually concluded. Each person on the Lightning League had a designated vehicle in the cartoon. Armed Force is the Lightning League leader, so of course that's what Jace drove. Had a big golden grappling arm on the roof. When Gillian made it, he meant to give it to his son Audric, Jace's father, but it went to his grandson instead. Drill Sergeant is flagged as the designated escape artist. It was equipped with a drill and is the one that's usually driven by Flora. Quick Draw is noted as being the team's weapons expert on card art. It was armed with a hidden cannon and is usually piloted by Gillian. Spike Trike is called the League's Scout, as I mentioned earlier, and is used by Herc when he's not at the helm of his space vessel. Trailblazer is this four-legged vehicle with a battering ram on the forward end of the rig, and at a much larger size, Trailblazer could carry one of the other vehicles. And Flingshot was another planned vehicle, but it was cancelled. It's a catapult-mounted vehicle built in the Stallions of Sandine. Spray Gunner was a vehicle that could spray fluid from a cannon. Pride of the Skies 2 is Herc's space barge spaceship. Battle Base is a mobile fortress that could connect to Herc's Pride of the Skies as a bridge. The parallels to Star Wars and Luke, Obi-Wan, Han Solo, and C-3PO are hard to ignore. Even Sawboss evokes Palpatine in humanoid form and Darth Vader in vehicle form. Not surprising since JMS is such a sci-fi and fantasy fan. Sort of like how Lord of the Rings and Star Trek share elements with Straczynski's Babylon 5. 
I'd couple Star Wars with some broad stroke story beats of ancient Greek Apollonius of Rhodes' epic tale, Argonautica, the adventure of Jason and the Argonauts. Jason is Jace here. Heracles was an Argonaut, and Heracles is Hercules in Roman. Hercules, Herc. See the connection? Hercules wearing Han Solo's vest thingy is what we have here. They even visit a planet called Argus at the end. The vehicles and chases are very Mad Max as well. For Larry Dottilio's influence, one of his seminal works is the 1981 Lovecraftian RPG, The Call of Cthulhu. The tendrils of the monster minds and their planet-spinning monstrosity is very Cthulhu-esque. This, in turn, draws inspiration from Tennyson's sonnet, The Kraken. Tennyson was influenced by John Milton, who wrote Paradise Lost, while John Keats found inspiration in Tennyson. Keats wrote Hyperion, which is based on the Titanomachy, a story about the twelve gods on Mount Olympus, led by Zeus, god of thunder and lightning. And so we make our way back full circle to the Light Wheels and the Lightning League. We could toss in the Lightning League itself as a quasi-pastiche of Lord Cardigan's cavalry immortalized in Tennyson's The Charge of the Light Brigade, though I suppose the comparison is in name only. Quick aside, that poem inspired Iron Maiden's 1983 The Trooper from Peace of Mind. Incidentally, the song is referenced in Max Brooks' World War Z, and guess who wrote the film adaptation? Yep, JMS. Full circle. Not long after that, and he'd find writing on Marvel's MCU film Thor, an Asgardian tale of the God of Thunder. Okay, we're getting way off track here. Next stop, the Lightning League's Ops. The Monster Minds transform into a plant-based vehicle. Led by Sawboss, the Monster Minds are hell-bent on destroying the magic root so they can conquer the universe. If I'm being honest, I think my exposure to the Monster Minds led to G.I. Joe's Cobra Law faction being a bit more palatable for me than for most people. So who are they? Well, the Monster Minds are led by their firstborn, the maniacal Sawboss. On Mattel's packaging, he's called Tyrant. Terror Tank is one of Sawboss's underbosses, and he oversees Terror Trooper clones. Toy Box Art called him a cannibal, so that's pretty fun for kids, right? Gun Grinner is another of Sawboss's underbosses, but he oversees the Gun Trooper clones. Gun Grinner is noted as an enforcer. KO Cruiser, yet another underboss, oversees KO Trooper clones. KO Cruiser's toy art calls him a demolitions expert. Then there's Beast Walker Commander, who oversees the Beast Walker clones. And a few other named villains are Dr. Zorg, who's Sawboss's scientist, Noah is Sawboss's spy, and Vantu is a wannabe sorceress. There was a 13-page comic book in Piff Gadget 922, and though that story was never finished, we did get a new character, another sorceress named Algoro, an evil one so naturally allied with Sawboss. At one point, a scientist named Audric Lightwheel had to create a special type of plant that could be grown out in space and which would help mitigate starvation in the galaxy. But when the plants were exposed to the effects of a supernova, it transformed the plants, making them both evil and sentient. They became an evil group of plant warriors called the Monster Minds. The Monster Minds can only be destroyed by the magic root. They took over the planet with the leader of the Monster Minds taking over Audric's lab and making that his base of operations while using up the planet's minerals and water. Audric quickly fled with half of the magic root to protect it while he trusted the other half to his loyal servant Oon to give to his only son Jace along with the legendary Ring of Light. Once the two halves of the root were combined, the Monster Minds would be destroyed. And this is where the core plot of the series lay. Jace was on a mission to find his father and reunite both halves of the root to destroy the Monster Minds and save the galaxy. So Jace was hiding on another planet, waiting for his father to show up, which is when his grandfather Gillian took him to a crystal forest to recover the magic ring, the symbol of the leader of the Lightning League. The ring was a powerful artifact, bringing in even more fantasy elements to this rather sci-fi tale. And this is also when he was given the vehicle Armed Force. In the Wheeled Warrior's Golden Book, they got Herc to join them by changing a mountain of lead into gold for a bit. They then got to work defeating Sawboss and his troops, namely the new launch tank. In the animated series, Gillian caused Herc to crash into their light bubble where they were hiding, gave him a fake diode to repair his ship, along with, just like the Golden Book, some lead disguised as fake gold. And under those false pretenses, they headed out into the cosmos. There were also some mini-comics included in He-Man and the Masters of the Universe books and the toy line, all of the sticker books, all basically telling the same origin. Some of these were done by Paul Kirchner. Kirchner and Larry Hama were friends, and Hama included Paul in his G.I. Joe line in the form of Kurt Schnur, codenamed Airtight. One of Paul's poster stories finds Jace stacking up all the Lightning League vehicles in a stack-and-attack maneuver to defeat the Monster Mines. So anyway, Jace ended up going to the planet Shang with Herc, a planet controlled by Sawboss. They were trying to find a vase that his father hid a secret message in, but Sawboss discovered their plan and ordered all of the vases to be destroyed. Jace got the golden vase, but before he could decipher his father's encoded message, it was stolen, leading Jace against Sawboss to get it back. After that adventure, Gilead regaled listeners with the story of a weaponsmith named Valorth. 
Valarth had made an incredibly powerful living armor to protect civilians, but the armor became too powerful and needed to be destroyed. And it was, except for the helmet. And Jace immediately set about hunting down the powerful helmet of Valarth. With the helmet that he found in a vault waiting to be found, just like the One Ring, Jace became nearly invincible, easily defeating some monster minds. But the helmet, just like the One Ring, started to change Jace. It was inherently evil and affecting him. It was the power of light, though, that defeated the Dark Helmet and ultimately destroyed it. Their next stop was a planet where Sawboss was setting plants to grow. Jace went there to stop them, but ran into the local warriors who captured them. Un took a shield from the stone and accidentally became their leader, so this allowed for the locals to realize they were there to help and to stop the monster mines. The League then found themselves on an abandoned security tanker ship after following another signal from Audric. Jace couldn't read the coordinates to where his father was without more power from their ship, but the self-destruct was activated and they had to work to stop it, and some monster mines narrowly winning that day. And so the story continued on from planet to planet, adventure to adventure, fighting Sawboss and his monster minds along their dangerous, harrowing journey to locate Jace's dad. In the final episode, the League headed to a planet called Argus 4 and met up with another person fighting the monster minds, an arrogant, vengeful, combative fighter named Aragon. Another name very similar to what we find in Tolkien's works. Aragon had set about, blind with anger and revenge, to destroy Sawboss no matter what it took. Aragon set some antimatter explosives to make a planetoid smash into Argus, which would kill Sawboss, but also kill untold millions of innocents. Antimatter weapons had been banned in the galaxy as too dangerous, but it didn't matter in his Machiavellian quest for revenge. Jace told him that if he did that, he'd be no better than Sawboss. And so this cleared up Aragon's head enough that he chose to sacrifice himself to save the planet. And that's how the animated series left the story, with plenty of plot ends left unanswered. JMS kind of got screwed at the end, but Straczynski quickly found work on the real Ghostbusters. As far as an end to the story, there was to be an animated feature following in the footsteps of both Transformers and G.I. Joe, but when the line wound down, so too did the film project. Per the Wheelie site, here's JMS's description in his own words, quote, As to an end to the story, yes, there was one. After the series was over, the head of the studio tried to sell the sponsors on the idea of an animated Jace feature. I was commissioned to write it, and I think it actually came out very well, and very, very intense. Sawboss was finally destroyed in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Jace comes through some truly life-changing events. We go back to the world that spawned Oon and Gillian for Jace's training. He falls in love, someone dies. It was a heck of a story. They couldn't get it made though, so that was the end of it. Though somewhere or other, I still have the script. According to JMS, the film's plot would have also seen Jace's Lightning League meet the original Lightning League. Jace and his father would have finally been reunited, however, Audric would be killed by Sawboss. In the final battle to save the galaxy, Jace would unite the magic root and destroy Sawboss and the monster mines forever. Ever. Speaking of wrapping things up, thank you for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe. That's a wrap on this one, my friends. I'm Jesse. This is JLS Comics, and I'll see you soon.